we put together a hit team. I'll surround these four shooters, two on Paul's side, two on Tommy's side, and we'll kill them right as they pull up. I'll have a walkie-talkie. I'll talk to the team step by step. This is a do or die hit. They gotta go. Nobody run. Everybody move at the same time. If there's cops, we shoot it out. It's a do or die. We do it, we pull it off, or we die there. History will talk about us forever. For the first time ever, Sammy the Bull Gravano tells his story. This is our thing. New York, 1985. The 80s in New York. I mean, it was a violent time. There was a lot of problems in New York, different families, different situations. Murders all over the place. Paul Castellano. Paul Castellano, I believe he lived in Brooklyn and he bought this big piece of property in Staten Island and he built this huge home. And the whole home was white. They actually called it the White House. It looked like the White House in Washington, D.C. And um, it was a beautiful, it was a mansion, actually, in a very rich area of Staten Island. I went there one day with Tato. The home was so big, he was complaining that he couldn't get hot water in his shower. I had a small plumbing company with my brother-in-law, Eddie Garofola, and uh, I just said, Paul, if you want me to help you with that, I have a plumbing company. Um, maybe I could go back to the office and have my engineers and people look at it and see if there's a problem and maybe we can fix it. And he told me, sure, do that. I went there back to my office. That day I talked to my brother-in-law Eddie and I talked to the engineer. And he started asking me questions. Where is the bedroom? Where is the hot water tank? And all of these different questions. I says, I don't know. I mean, I went in the house, I sat at the table. I didn't walk around the whole house. But uh, I made an appointment to bring him there so he could take a look. Paul allowed it. I went back with him. He took a look at everything. We went back to the office and he said, Sam, it's a simple problem. The house is so big. By the time the water comes out of the hot water tank and it flows through the pipes, it has to flow in a long, long distance. And he's not going to get hot water. The best he'll get is lukewarm water. So I said, well, what could we do to fix it? And he said, it's an easy fix. I'd have to go in. And along the line, we put this cord that we wrap around the pipe. And there's electric in it. They're heating coils around the pipe every so often. So the water would never have a chance to cool down. The pipe is red hot. And the water flows, hits those areas, it keeps it hot. It would never be super hot, but it would be a lot hotter than he has. He allowed me to do that. And he was super impressed with all the construction and engineers he had building this house. I got it done. I'm generating a lot of money for Paul Castellano. It's hard to pinpoint how much because I don't know when I do something to control a union and a job goes a certain way, it may not be my job. I don't know the benefits. I know the benefits, but the amount of money is astronomical in some cases, I'm sure. One day I went there to give you an example about monies. Paul said, go with Tommy and help Tommy. He's going down the basement. I went with Tommy and 
there was a big, big, long table. There's two, three, maybe four suitcases. He says, help me straighten this out, Sam. Okay, what do we have to do? And he says, get that suitcase. I picked the suitcase up, it's pretty heavy. I put it on the table. He unzipped it and opened it. All of it was money. 20s, 50s, $100 bills. I never saw so much money. And we were stacking it on the table. 20s with the 20s, the 50s with the 50s, the 100s with the 100s. Suitcase after suitcase after suitcase. I have no idea how much money that was, but I've never seen money like that in my life. And there's times where I did make a lot of money. It went from one end of the table almost to the other end of the table, different stacks. So I said, well, what else do we have to do? Are we gonna count these things? Because there was rubber bands around packs of it and stacks of it. We were taking the rubber bands off and stacking it up and stuff like that. And I said, do we have to count this now? No, no, no. He said, we'll be here a month counting this. How much is it? I told him. He says, I have no idea but it's in the mega millions for sure. So the relationship he was having with Chin and Fat Tony stepped down as the boss, and now Chin was the boss. And Vinnie DiNapoli, they were making tons of fucking money. And I was in the middle of it, but I can't, each particular job or each thing I did, I don't know how much money it generated, but when you're dealing with 50, 60 million dollar high-rise jobs that are coming down, a hundred million dollar job. There's different trades. And when you're juggling in different, you have your hand in different pockets and different trades and you're doing them favors, only God knows. I would make some money on it on occasion, but I was making good money now on my own. I had a small concrete company. I had a drywall company. I had a plumbing company. I had a flooring company. Even when they had that asbestos removal, I had an asbestos removal company. I had a container company where they dropped the containers to take the construction debris away. I had partners in a lot of these businesses. My money, at one point, I couldn't even count how fast this thing was coming in. I was still a major Shylock. I had over a million five hundred thousand in the street. People paying me big on this money. What I used to do once a week is go home and everything I gave out, everything I collected, and after I spent money all week long and gave everybody their ends, I came to a conclusion I was making 45,000 a week in cash back then. It's probably more like 200,000 a week now. So I was making 45,000 a week in cash plus these legitimate businesses. The last year before I went to prison, me and my wife filed, I filed $750,000 legitimate income. So my money was astronomical myself. I could only imagine what Paul Castellano were making. The, the money was enormous. I had great respect for him. It deteriorated over the years because of things he, he did not only to me, but to other people. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, December 1984. Paul Castellano. He was getting indicted in the commission case. That all stemmed from John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero's tapes. All the bosses were getting in trouble. Those tapes gave the government the right to bug all of these bosses, including Paul Castellano's house. All kinds of things were going on. Troubles were flying all over the place. And we all knew about it, what was going on. I talked to Frankie DeChico many times about it. John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero were in big trouble. 
their mouth got them to a point where everybody was hating on them. DB told me that Angelo Ruggiero wanted to talk to me in Queens at a certain time in a certain corner. So I got in my car and I went there. When I got there, I was pulling on the side. I saw Angelo standing on the corner. I got out of the car, I walked over. Like I said, I knew what the problems were. So I shook his hand. How you doing, Angelo? How's everything going? And he said, Sam, you know what's going on. I said, I have an idea of what's going on, yeah. And he said, we really, really need your help. In what way? We're going to kill Paul Castellaro. I said, you're going to kill Paul Castellaro. You and John? Yeah, of course. He's the boss of bosses. And that's your plan, is to kill a boss. Yes. Where's John? Well, he's busy right now. He's busy right now. You're asking me to kill the boss of bosses or help you kill the boss of bosses. And John's too busy to come here. What is this, like a, a favor? Do me a favor, pick up a gallon of milk for me. When I go home, I don't have any milk. This is a fucking joke. Here. I'm not gonna tell you yes, and I'm not gonna tell you no. What I'm gonna do, Angelo, is I'm gonna get in my car, and I'm gonna leave. I'm going straight to Frankie DeChico's house and tell him exactly what this conversation is about. I'm not gonna tell anybody else. Sammy, it's fine. You could tell him he's gonna be with us, you'll see. Yeah, well, we'll see. I got in the car and I left. I drove straight to Staten Island, straight to Frankie DeChico's house. Hey, what's up, bro? I said, I just met with Angelo Ruggiero. Let's go in your backyard. We need to talk. We went in his backyard. Frankie DeChico was like a big brother to me. He was 14 years older than me, and he was always there when I was in trouble, and vice versa. So we talked openly and honestly. Frankie said, and John wasn't there. No, no, John wasn't there. This is what Angelo told me. We talked for a while, not so much about John and Angelo's problem, but about the captain that he allowed to be killed in Connecticut, the maid, and so many of the stories that he did to run amok where we didn't like him anymore. There were certain things that were done to me personally that I didn't like. I didn't want that as part of the conversation. I wanted to base this solely on what was going on right now and the things he did as far as goes in Austria. Not me personally. So Frankie told me, he said, listen, Maybe it's time to save this crew. I had said, they pushed drugs, they broke every rule in the book. Every boss in the country is getting him having a problem because of things they said and did. This isn't our problem. He said, I agree. But, Sam, I think it's time to save this crew and put Goza Nostra at the same time back to where it's supposed to be. I think Paul has to go. I said, okay, Frankie.
we could do this. I really, if we do this, John doesn't deserve to be the boss. I think you should be the boss. You deserve it. You did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. He did everything wrong. He said, Sammy, you know this guy by now. He's got an ego like the Empire State Building. He can't be my underboss. We'll have problems from day one. He's a narcissist. He'd be jealous, envious. We'd have problems right away. I could be his underboss. He can't be mine. You could be immediately a captain and eventually the Gunsley had a family. Me and you will be the power behind the throne. We'll make him into a good boss. And I give you my word, if he doesn't pay attention and act the fool like he does, we'll kill him, I'll be the boss, and you'll be my underboss. And Sammy, in this thing, I know you're trying to keep this strictly goes in Austria about what's going on. But don't forget what he did to you and your family. I don't, Frank. But I don't want this to be about revenge. I will never forget. I put my hand out and shook his hand. My brother, Frank and Chico. Okay, Frank. We don't, we're not the type of people who sit on the sidelines. We're either going to go against him or we're going to go for him. He says, I'll make an appointment with John Gotti. I want you there, me and you. He got in touch with uh, Angelo Ruggiero, called him in and told him. Gave him a time and a date and a place in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, near the ocean, where we would meet him. He said to Angelo, you're not, you're not going to be there. I don't want you there. You tell your fucking faggot boss, he has the problem. He didn't have time to meet Sammy and with you. Well, he better meet at this appointment alone. And we'll talk to you. That's what happened. Angelo left. John came. It was a day or two later at the most. <laughs> He met us in a park right across from the ocean. We went into this park. No one was around us. And we talked. Frankie did most of the talking. He told John, he said, listen, you can't do this without us, me and Sammy. If you do this, you'll have the Gambinos against you. You'll have the Castellanos against you. They have ties to Sicily. You'll have them against you. The Westies are under his wing. You'll have them against you. You'll have most of the captains in this family against you, and you'll have me and Sammy against you. You don't stand a fucking chance. This is not a fucking game. We'll save you and your crew with us and maybe a few others. We could take him out. We'll make you the boss. Me and Sammy will be the power behind you, behind the throne. We'll make you strong. You have to do the right thing. According to Gozanostra and according to us. John was elated. The grin on his face, he was, he was finished. We gave him a spark. 
at life and become the boss besides. He didn't deserve it. He didn't warrant this position, but he was going to get it. He was going to win. We were going to make him win. He shook Frankie's hand, he shook my hand, and he left. We eventually had Joe Gallo, who was the acting consigliere of the family, was willing to betray Paul Castellano, and he did. Neil Delacroach was the underboss. He was loved by both sides, by the entire family, by other families, and respected. He was dying of cancer. Meetings were going to happen with him. Frankie DeChico and John Gotti, and on occasion, Angelo, would go to the house and meet with him. Unbeknownst to anyone, the house was bugged. Somehow or another, right underneath his deathbed, there was a wire, a bug. A lot of these tapes are monitored. The FBI had them. I don't know if they still have them. But I think it was came out on occasion. Neil disagreed with the hit. He told John Gotti and Angelo, you broke every fucking rule in the book. All kinds of people got in trouble on kind of you guys by the things you did. Now you want to break the golden rule and kill a boss, a sitting boss. Not because of things he did, but because of what you did. I will not agree. You can't kill the boss. The boss is the boss is the boss. The answer is no. He wants those tapes, Angelo. Those tapes that hurt him and everybody else. Angelo had refused to give the tapes because they're talking about drugs, they're talking about the whole commission, they're talking about bosses. He said, Give him the tapes. If you want me to sit for you, I will sit for you. I will try to save your life. If you're afraid, run. But to kill him, the answer is no. That put us in a weird position. Normally, we would have to take out the boss and him. But we idolized him and loved him and respected him. That was Goza Nostra. He wouldn't do a power move. He wouldn't do a money move. That wasn't Neil. He was straight up Goza Nostra. You can't kill the boss. So we're not going to kill the boss or the underboss for sure. But we were still bent on killing Paul and Tommy Bellotti. Tommy Bellotti was a serious captain with a lot of guys, a big crew, a brother or another tough guy, Joey Bellotti. They had a bunch of young sons who were pretty tough kids. But Tommy Bellotti was a bully. Tommy Bellotti was not liked by any family, including our own family. So there was no problem in killing Tom. He was going to be there anyway. He was going to be on their side in the war. So killing him with Paul was a good idea. New York, April 1985. We played with this for a while. It got to a point where Frankie DeChico called me. He said, Sammy, we're sitting with this and talking about this now for months. I'm afraid that it may leak. We didn't tell our crews. We didn't tell anybody about our plans. But John and Angelo had big mouths. We didn't know who the fuck they told. We didn't know what Joe Piney would say, who was a captain 
and also recruited into this hit and was willing to be in it. He was a powerful captain. He was the captain who was in the original Pizza Connection case, a major case. They made movies about it and everything else. Heroin coming in from Sicily to France to the United States. So he was in. Joe Gallo was in. I was in. I was an acting captain. Tato wouldn't know what I was doing. I wouldn't tell him. Frankie was in. John Gotti was in. DB was even recruited. He was a made guy, not a killer. But he had a lot of connections, a lot of power, a lot of money, and he was in. So Frankie told me, I'm afraid that this might leak. Me and you should hit the mattresses. Where do you want to do that, Frankie? Joe Watts was under Frankie DeChico, and Frankie Botts was under Frankie DeChico at that time. Joe Watts had a mansion in Staten Island in a secluded area. He had maid's court quarters in the basement. So we would live in the maid's quarters. Frankie Botts would stay with us, sleep with us, stay with us always, and he would be armed. Joe Watts, would, it's his house, he would be there all the time. He says, tell your crew you're going somewhere. Don't tell them where. But if somebody makes an appointment with you on Tuesday at 10 o'clock in some bar or restaurant or somewhere, and my crew will be listening. If I have an appointment at 10 o'clock, the same time as you, the same day as you, they know, and we're both going to get hit. But we won't be there. We'll know the war has started. I believe it was October something or other, there was a party. It was my niece's something, some sort of a birthday party or graduation, I don't know what it was. I was there with my wife. I left from that party. I grabbed my wife from the side and I told the Deb, I have to leave from this party. I'm going away. I can't tell you when I'm coming back if I'm coming back. You can't ask questions. Don't talk to nobody. People will come and talk to you. Our brother-in-law Eddie, Big Louie, people will come to you and talk to you. You'll be all right. Take care of the kids. You have no idea when you'll be back, no. No, and it's not open for discussion. I left in October, and I hit the mattresses with Frankie DeChico and Frankie Botts in Joe Watts' house. Some of the meetings took place there. Neil was still hanging on, getting closer and closer to death, but hanging on. I remember some of the meetings between me and Frankie and John Gotti. Frankie was a rough guy. Physically, all the way around, a tough guy and a rough guy. And a rough guy with his mouth. Didn't take no bullshit from nobody. A couple of times, he growled at John. I remember one time him telling John, shut the fuck up. You guys created this monster that's going to happen. Do you have any idea how many fucking people are going to die? Probably some of us. Maybe all of us. Maybe we'll lose the war and we'll all be killed for this. <sighs> Nobody reached out for me except for minor things that I could have straightened out. The only one in my crew who knew was the old man Joe Peruta. Why he knew is Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti used to stop in a Greek diner on the way to court and eat breakfast. We thought about Joe Peruta going into a bathroom 
and coming out with a shotgun and killing Paul and Tommy. We would have other people sitting in the diner in different places to back Peruta up. That was one of the plans that was on the table, but we didn't take that plan. New York, December 2nd, 1985. Neil Delacroach died of the cancer. We all went to his funeral, hundreds of people from every family was there. Who was missing was Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti. When they were asked why they didn't go, Paul Castellano's answer was, I'm on trial. There would be newspaper, there would be FBI, there would be cops, there'd be people taking pictures. It wouldn't be good. We wanted to say, this guy that you didn't attend is wake. Your underboss, your brother, has kept you alive for months behind your back. It ignited a firestorm with us. Another thing that happened was an appointment was made at Sparks Steakhouse. There was supposed to be a meeting there. Paul Castellano from court would be there at 5, 5.30 at night with Tommy Bellotti. He wanted Jimmy Brown, Johnny Gamarano, Danny, Danny Marino, Tommy Gambino, Frankie DeChico would attend this meeting. We knew about it. Frankie was told about it. We met secretly again. I said, I think we could work this thing out. Frankie said, what are you talking about? We know where he's going. We know who's going there. And you're invited in there. We'll put together a hit team. We'll take him right outside fucking Spark Steakhouse. We know what time he's meeting. We know everything. John Gotti said, there'll be a ton of people. It's right before Christmas, December 16th. People are coming out of all of these buildings. Instead of going home, they're waiting for their families to meet them, to go Christmas shopping, to go to different things. It will be mad crowds. There'll be thousands of cops. Frankie DeChico says to John, shut the fuck up. Sammy has been involved in two mafia wars already. This will be his third mafia war. Let him plan it. John nodded. I said, that confusion will be in our favor. When the shots start to happen, people will be running in every which direction. The confusion could be used to our advantage. We don't have much time left. Neil is gone. There's no more excuses. Frankie, me and you, it's already October, November, December, two months that we disappeared. It's going to leak out. We know the time, the place, who's going to get hit. We know it all. We put together a hit team. I'll surround these four shooters, two on Paul's side, two on Tommy's side, and we'll kill them right as they pull up. I'll have a walkie-talkie. 
I'll talk to the team step by step. We'll call the best hit guys that we know in. Every single one of them are capable. And we'll tell them, we'll read them the fucking riot act. This is a do or die hit. They gotta go. One, two, nobody run. Everybody move at the same time. If there's cops, we shoot it out. It's a do or die. We do it, we pull it off, or we die there. History will talk about us forever. What do you want me to do? I want you to stay inside, Frankie, with the, all them guys. You'll have a gun on you. If they react in any way to the shooting, tell them to sit the fuck down. Show them the gun. They'll sit. They're not stupid. If that don't happen, then walk out and leave with the team. John, you'll be in the car with me. You'll be my driver. When everybody moves and is gone, we'll pull up and check it out. I'll also be not only calling the shots, but I'll be a backup shooter. If the shooting starts and there's cops, I'll be the first one out of the car shooting. They won't even know where the fuck we are or who we are. Some of us might die. I think most of us will get away, if not all of us. Frankie says to John, that's the plan. I'm in. You asked us in. This is what you're, you make the decision. This is the plan. You want to do it? Good. You don't want to do it? We walk. Do it on your own. He agrees immediately. New York, December 16th, 1985. So the hit is on. That day, we go by my office. It's actually the night before. We talk to the hit team. We tell them now, finally, at the last minute, who's gonna die and what we're doing. And that it's a do or die hit. Nobody moves without the team. One guy, if you run before the team, keep running because we're gonna kill you. That's the rule. Everybody is in. One or two or three of them, I'll show you how tough they were, said, Sammy, we'll meet you in hell. Okay, brother, that's how we gotta think. We'll all die and go to hell, or we'll all get away with this. That's the fucking attitude I wanna hear. I'm not sure who came up with that idea with uh, Russian hats and white jackets and whatever. It's a brilliant idea. It wasn't my idea, but it was a brilliant idea. And I agreed to it. We, went, we met them downtown away from Sparks that afternoon. I met with all of them. They had these white coats on, Russian hats. These look great. It's a perfect cover. We left, me and John. And we went a half a block away from Sparks, sitting in a car. Five, 5.30. They're not here yet. Something's wrong. I'm talking to John. I'm on the passenger side. I'm coaching the guys who are on the team. There's 11 guys, I believe, on the head. And I'm talking to them, stay calm, relax. They're not here yet, but relax. I turn to my right, and my God, right next to us, it's 
People who know the streets, there's parked cars, parked cars, and there's one thing, a car could fit in the middle. So from my seat to Tommy Bellotti's seat is not even five feet away. I said, oh my God, they're right next to us. I, tell, I go for my gun. John says, don't shoot. If they turn around, they see me and you sitting here in this fucking car over here, right near fucking Sparks. They're not idiots. They'll hit the gas and take off. If they turn around, I'm gonna start shooting. Get your fucking gun out and get ready. Paul is sitting there with the windshield, the sun visor down with the light on and he's showing Tommy Bellotti a card. And Tommy Bellotti is looking that way away from me. The light turns green. They start to pull through the light. I tell the team, the light just turned green. The first car out is them. They're gonna pull right in front of Sparks. That's how you, it's the people park your car, you pull there, you get out, and that's exactly what they're gonna do. There's no other parking spots on the streets. Get ready. The shooters are ready. The backup teams are ready. The backup shooters are ready. I'm ready. My heart is pounding. 